To connect your Frieza, you will now read. Good morning. This is Peter Benson. Good morning. This is Diane Yulings and Carm Arventi. I'm glad you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Hey, Peter. Good morning. It's Justin, and we're here at the U.S. Saudi Business Council. And I think we're going to try and mute Good. everybody uh, on the call. You're muted. You're muted. Okay. Good morning. I just, uh, I'm in France, and... Uh, we're locked in because the Tour de France has just gone by and they closed all the roads. Good morning, this is Peter Benson. Peter, we can hear you, and um, everyone else, uh, please mute your microphones. Uh, we should have three active microphones for this this uh, meeting, and we'll start in about five minutes. Yes, and I, Justin, you can still, can you still hear me. Is that correct? Yes, Peter, we can hear you. I'm just on mute right now. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. We're going to begin today's seminar. Um, my name is Edward Burton, President and CEO of the U.S. Saudi Arabian Business Council. Uh, and I am pleased to welcome you to the Council's webinar on the Kingdom's new commercial specification standards and the implementation of this new program that is already underway. Uh, I certainly welcome all of you, uh, most of you from industry, but others uh, that are interested in today's topic. Uh, you should know that this webinar is another in a series of informative online sessions whereby our council aims to provide the American and Saudi business communities with the latest and most relevant information concerning business in the kingdom and, of course, for Saudis, uh, the U.S. market. Today we have two experts on our subject matter, Mr. Justin Magruder, President of the Electronic Commerce Code Management Association, or ECMA as it's known, and Mr. Peter Benson, Executive Director and Chief Technical Officer of ECMA. Before I introduce them to you, uh, let me take care of first uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping matters for the conduct of today's webinar. Our webinar will last approximately one hour, and in fairness to everyone's time, we'll do our best to stick to that time frame. During this webinar, you will have the ability to submit questions to our presenters electronically. If you have a question during the session, you may enter it in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and send it to our presenters. We will wait, of course, until Mr. Magruder and Mr. Benson complete their presentations before we address your questions and invite them to respond. We can't promise, of course, to get to every question submitted. However, we will do our best. If we don't get to your particular question, we can answer them offline, and our presenters have agreed to make themselves available to you after this webinar should you wish to connect with them separately. At the close of the session, the contact information for today's expert presenters will appear on the screen so that you may request them to possibly work with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Also, we ask that if you are dialing in by conference number, please make sure to mute your phone. Uh, if you are using your computer's audio, please make sure that you are in listen-only mode. I should also inform you that we intend to make a recording of this webinar and make it available to our corporate community. Uh, and uh, next, I would like to give special thanks to our economic business analyst, Ms. Danielle Weed, and uh, the rest of our council staff for the great work that they've done in working with our presenters and also our webinar audience to participate with us today. And now let me uh, say a few words about our council. We are a, a nonprofit. We are what the IRS calls a trade association. We're funded by the private sector. We have over 300 members, both U.S. and Saudis, uh, everything ranging from Fortune 500 companies to small and medium-sized companies, both in the United States and Saudi Arabia. And, of course, we cover a range of industries. Uh, we know just enough about most of the industries that have uh, compatibility between the two markets uh, to direct the companies uh, and also counsel them in terms of market penetration or market share expansion uh, in either market. And of course, we have a fully staffed office here in Washington, and we have a fully staffed office in Riyadh. Next slide, please. Our mission is to foster, develop, and expand the U.S.-Saudi business relationship through trade and investment, and of course to contribute to the accurate depiction of the business environment in Saudi Arabia. And so this mission is uppermost in our mind as we 
operate on a daily basis both here and in the kingdom. Uh, and we continue to counsel companies. Uh, we have counseled thousands of companies o over the last 24 years of existence. Uh, and we look forward to many more years in helping companies in the United States understand the Saudi market and also Saudi companies to gain entry and knowledge about the U.S. market. Next slide, please. And so this brings us to the beginning of the substantive portion of our webinar. Um, it's now my pleasure to begin uh, to introduce our two presenters. I will begin with Mr. Peter Benson. He is the Executive Director and Chief Technical Officer of the Electronic Commerce Code Management Association, again ECMA. Peter is an expert in distributed information systems, content encoding, and master data management. He designed one of the very first commercial electronic mail software applications, WordStar Messenger, and was granted a landmark British patent in 1992 covering the use of electronic mail systems to maintain distributed databases. Peter designed and oversaw the development of a number of strategic distributed database management systems used extensively in the United Kingdom and the United States by the public relations and media industries. From 1994 to 1998, Peter served as the elected chairman of the American National Standard Institute Accredited Committee, uh, ANSI ASCX 12E, the standards committee responsible for the development and maintenance of EDI standard for product data. Peter is known for the design, development, and global promotion of the United Nations standard products and services code system run by the UN's development program. As an internationally recognized commodity classification, and more recently for the design of his association's Open Technical Dictionary, or EOD as it's known, which is an electronically recognized open technical dictionary based on the NATO uh, NATO codification system. Peter is the project leader for the ISO 22745 and ISO 8000, as well as the ISO TC 184 CS4 Quality Committee Covenir. He is an expert in the development and maintenance of master data quality as well as an internationally recognized proponent of open standards that he believes are critical to protect data assets from the applications used to create and manipulate them. Peter Benson holds a French baccalaureate in mathematics and physics, a bachelor's degree in agriculture and master's degree in marketing from London University. And uh, to economize time, I'll now introduce Justin Magruder. Uh, Justin is president at NOTIC, chairman at ECMA. His specialties are customer insights and predictive analytics, product design and analytics, market data, low latency data, making big data seem small, data warehouse design, reference and master data management and architecture for collateral management, client and counterparty, Product, instrument, pricing, data quality management, flow, profiling, and processing, market data analysis, selection, and sourcing, metadata data management, ETL architecture, transaction data management, financial market data, financial transaction process management. Wow, Justin, after all that, I'm sure you'll have to live up to the content which, which you're going to provide. And with that, uh, audience, let's uh, go directly to the presentations. Edward, thank you very much for that in-depth introduction. I don't think I've heard an introduction that detailed in, in many years, so it's refreshing to uh, hear the long journey that we've been on to get this far. But thank you very much indeed. Welcome. Only I... <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, have to rely on Justin on the slides because I'm blind in terms of my uh, the actual uh, bandwidth is not bringing a slide through. But luckily, I have a uh, another version of it. So, Justin, I'm going to refer to the slide number. I hope your slide number is the same as mine. Otherwise, we're going to have a fun and games as I, I'm commenting on a different slide. So, I take it we're looking at slide four, which is the ECMA slide. I take it that's correct. We'll make it work, Peter. 
And uh, yes, we're on the way. We're way to work. Okay. So um, basically, ECMA was uh, has been working on a project in Saudi Arabia for now almost uh, seven years. We did an original pilot um, for the National Industrial Development Cluster Program, and basically we were asked to see if it was possible to basically bring data together from, from major stakeholders, major companies in Saudi, and allow them to get some a common view uh, of what they were buying and what they were using as a step towards localization. And it proved immensely successful. We proved it was possible to bring this data together. And the reason it was possible is that uh, Aramco and Sabic and SEC, SECC were all using the same basic standards for describing goods. They were using the ECMO Open Technical Dictionary as the coding mechanism, and they were actually um, using many of the code systems that we've been developing for the last 20 years. And that was the first step that we showed we could actually bring this data together. So I wonder, just, with this project that we're working on here, has a very specific goal. Of course, its online goal is localization, but it's actually linked also to the military supply. There are seven stakeholders, seven armed forces in Saudi who do not exchange data on what they're buying as well as they could, as well as different NATO organizations do. And part of this process and project was to improve the visibility of what they were buying across the different armed services and, and also across all of the commercial stakeholders. So, Justin, if you go to slide uh, uh, five first. So if you see on this slide the logos that are there, of course, the logo is MEIM in the, in the middle of the screen. They're the underlying um, sponsor of this program. On the left-hand side, you have an industrial cluster development program who've actually been guiding this program since the beginning. And on the right-hand side, of course, you see the logo of the armed forces. Uh, they are a major player, a major contributor in this um, project. And the project basically is the implementation of ISO 8000, which is an international standard for quality master data. By implementing that standard, the data becomes more visible. And as you'll see this presentation, there's lots of things that can be done. And um, that's really what we're looking at. If you go to slide six. Justin? Yep. OK. So the goal of the project is to support localization efforts, not only of, uh, of NIM, but also of the Ministry of Defense and large uh, commercial firms. Uh, we are creating what's called the NATO Codification Bureau. This is an actual bureau inside Saudi that will control um, the participation of the Saudi, uh, of Saudi military within the NATO system. NATO has a system where all the participants in NATO actually exchange material master data and vendor master data. It's called the NSN, NATO stock number, and the NCAGE, the NATO commercial entity code. So they share the information amongst themselves um, so they can cooperate more effectively. And commercial companies have adopted the same principle of, of using common data and common ways of describing data. Go to slide seven. Now, slide seven basically um, gives you the scope of the project and what we're trying to do. And the National Industrial Information Center, NIAC, has been created. And its job is to collect data from Saudi manufacturers and to provide data to Saudi manufacturers. What data? It's data about the products that are being purchased and eventually they'll switch to service, add services as well. Um, so on the one hand, the NIC, the center, will receive data and is receiving data from Saudi manufacturers in terms of what products they are making and what products they are importing and also from the center Saudi companies can go and look and say, I'm looking for this product. Who else is importing it? Uh, who else has exemption on this product? And again, it's about saving time and effort. So it makes it much easier for the uh, government to get a better view of the goods and services that are being manufactured in Saudi and the goods and services that are being imported. 
Um, it applies to industrial license. We'll talk a little bit about that, but also to the exemption. And this, as you know, if one of your customers in Saudi is unable to find a similar product to the one you're manufacturing in Saudi, they can apply for exemption from import tariffs. This, of course, makes that process a lot easier because it's easier to demonstrate rather than the apology letter that is typically what you have to send to explain, I did look, but I couldn't find it. Pretty easy. This was not in the database. It doesn't look like it's manufactured in Saudi, and therefore you're eligible for the exemption from import duty. OK, let's go on to slide eight, Justin. And and this is a little bit of a, of a crowded slide. Um, a few colored pictures on it, but it's really very simple. It's the it describes the process we're using for building the system. And basically, as you see from the very bottom, we bring in data from the seven armed forces and seven commercial stakeholders. Now, seven commercial stakeholders are Aramco, SABIC, SWCC, SEC, uh, Madden, MIC. I've missed anybody there. Um, oh, and Alphanar. Excuse me. I missed Alphanar on that list as well. So we bring in the data from their systems, we bring in their PO data, we bring in their material master, we bring in their vendor master, and we basically uh, go through a process of standardization of the data, and then we move it into our server. Now that's that's not actually not very hard. Um, it looks complicated, but it's not. But the next stage is the most important stage and why we're having this workshop today. Because once the data is in that server, if it is your data, if it is your product that's, been, that's in that system, you're going to receive an email asking you to verify and validate that this is the correct data. Now, at any time you want, you can add your product data to the system, uh, to the main server. But if your data, if you're selling a product to any of those major stakeholders or any of the seven armed forces, it's going to appear inside the system, and it's going to send a request to you for verification and validation of the data is correct. Next slide, Justin. Now, the reason everybody's doing this, now we're looking at, I believe, at slide nine, is that if, as a manufacturer or a supplier, you provide a specification, now, specification is not complicated. I'm going to show you what it looks like. It's, you know, everybody has specifications. But typically today, your specifications are in PDF. It's great. Everybody can read them. They're electronic. It's great. But a computer cannot process them. But if your data is put into a standard form, and it's really not difficult to do, then the different computer systems can read that data. So for example, Aramco or SABIC are using SAP as an ERP system. And for every material that they buy, they have to create a material record manually. Very time consuming to do that. They don't have to do that anymore because your specification is directly readable by their SAP application. They can see it on the screen, and they can absorb it into their system automatically. Go to slide 10. Now, this is what a technical specification looks like in standard form. It's on top of the screen. It's really straightforward. It's what you would see as a PDF. On the left-hand side, you have the properties, the characteristics that describe the item. And the right-hand side, you have values. All right, so here we have maximum pressure. Then we have pipe size. The reason they're in blue and underlined is they're actually hyperlinked to the dictionary. They're not just you know, words that you know, read it and weep. It's basically linked to a dictionary that contains the definitions. What do I mean by, by max pressure? All right, what do I mean by pipe size? Luckily, you don't have to develop those definitions because most of them are already there. It's a rare occasion where you do have to add them, but it's actually very rare this day because there's about 4 million definitions in the system already. And all of the NATO, everything that NATO buys is already described using the system. That's 36 million parts already described using the system. Now, what is the advantage? If I have a specification in standard form, I can automate the creation of the descriptions, the item name, which is what we call the short description, the long description, which is typically the purchase order description, and I can also automate the assignment of classifications. 
And for anybody who is running the ERP system, this is where uh, you get into a lot of expense, you get into a lot of bad quality data, because basically it's not being managed correctly. This automates that process. These are open standards. There's no, you don't have to buy any, anything to do this, you don't have to pay anybody a license to do this. It's simply, you simply need to know how to encode this data. The dictionary is free and open. Uh, next slide, Justin. And of course, the whole benefit to the process is that as specifications are converted into this standard form, that it becomes really easy, or easier, I should say, to analyze and to search. And search becomes a lot faster and a lot more accurate. So that's really the, what the purpose of this is, is to create at the center a national information uh, database that allows industry to look for, look for the information they need and for the government also to access, look for the information they need as well. Um, slide 12, Justin. So of course, if, you, if one of your products is already in the system, you're going to get a letter probably in the next couple of weeks, maybe four weeks, I, I believe, which explains to you that it is your obligation to verify and validate this data. Now, if you do not respond, if you ignore that, the first, the second, and the third, then your product gets marked in the database as this data has not been confirmed and we don't recommend you use it. And, uh, and there's lots of companies now, Sabic, Ramco, and others, that have what we call a preferred material database. This is what they're recommending inside the organization. If you're going to buy something, you want to be looking at the preferred material database, and you cannot get on the preferred material database unless your data has been validated. So there's a, a real benefit to making sure you control the data. Now, you, supply, well, the suppliers and manufacturers, are actually control what they say about their product. Nobody tells them how to, specify, to write a technical specification. It's only how you encode it. So think about it as PDF. Whatever you write in your specification, instead of converting it to a PDF, you're converting it to a standardized electronic form, which is easier for a computer to read. But nobody's telling you what characteristics you have to put to describe your item. Now, there is one other piece to this, um, which Justin's going to be talking about a little bit more, is that beyond having a specification of your product, all your part numbers must also conform to a new standard, ISO 8115. Now, it's really simple. It's probably the easiest standard to conform to. It simply says that your part number must identify who you are. So if I see a part number, I know whose part number it is, which means you must put something in front of your part number, your name, for example, long as it's registered, that says this is a part number. For example, Alphanar has lots of part numbers, and it says Alphanar colon and their number. It makes it very clear to everybody that this part number was issued by Alphanar. And of course, if you want to know the specification of this item, well, often ours is the authoritative source. Now, as Justin's going to explain, there's two types of prefixes you can use. The first prefix is a NATO end cage. If you're doing business with the military in any country in the world, you will have an end cage, the six-digit alphanumeric number that comes from the NATO database. You can use that as your prefix. There's no cost to having one as long as NATO issues them to you. However, you can also, as Justin's going to explain to you, you can also have a commercial prefix, but you must register it. So commercial prefix is a branded prefix. It's typically your name or short abbreviation of your name, and that is, in fact, what you use as prefix to your part numbers. So I use the example of SKF because I can spell SKF. They make bearings or Timken bearings. Instead of just having a number, it says SKF colon the number. I know that part number was issued by and it belongs to SKF. So it's pretty simple stuff. Um, and, and that prefix, that commercial prefix, is very much like a DNS. You basically register, the, register it and you pay every year to maintain it, but it's a very nominal fee. Anyway, 
Um, again, I will be able to answer questions at the end. And if you need anything, you can, of course, contact me. Uh, and of course, I believe this presentation is going to be distributed as well. So I'd like to pass the baton over to Justin. Justin is responsible for the management of the prefixes. I'm responsible for managing the technical specifications and, the, and managing the registry of those specifications. And Justin is responsible for managing the registry of the prefixes. Justin, over to you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Ed. Um, and it's uh, nice to see a large crowd here today uh, to learn about the new standard and the application of the standard. I'd like to say at the beginning, Ed, uh, that long list of, of uh, my skills that you read is not going to be easy to live up to. And I don't think I'll be able to do that today. Um, but I do want to just add a little bit of color. Um, I met Peter um, about 10 years ago. Uh, in a job at a large financial firm um, that was re is responsible for a significant portion of the uh, global uh, uh, credit markets uh, operations. And um, I'd spent about 25 years uh, beginning my career on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange 25 years ago. Um, and I've been involved in the automation of, of uh, order management and processing for uh, the financial services sector for large firms and the financial services sector for my entire career. Um, I've worked with uh, current clients like the New York Stock Exchange, uh, JP Morgan, uh, UBS Investment Bank, Deutsche Bank, and a number, a number of other firms who sort of have led the way in the automation of the uh, financial markets. Today, uh, we settle trades almost immediately, uh, almost instantaneously in many markets. When I started 24 years ago, we were settling trades in seven days and trying to get down to five-day trade settlement, um, and that was difficult at the time. We did it through the automation of order management processes, and that's what we're talking about now. We're talking about streamlining and automating the straight-through processing of orders for uh, industrial organizations that need to purchase or that are trying to sell uh, services and products and parts to customers. So why are we talking about Quip Lab and Quip prefixes today? Well, Peter spent a lot of time talking about the principles and the program to help the Saudi, uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the, the uh, military agencies and, and large organizations in Saudi streamline their order management processes. And what we've done with, uh, with the help of ECMA and a number of interested parties, some of whom you'll meet at the end of this presentation, uh, we've got a slide with some of the names of people who can help you uh, comply with the standard, is we've developed a program called Quip Lab, which develops uh, registers and distributes prefixes for the use in these order management processes. So what is a Quip, a quip prefix? A quip prefix is a unique name or a phrase that's used by companies or organizations really of any kind to uniquely identify products and replacement parts and services. And we'll use as an example one of our friendly early adopters, um, Corning, which is a large uh, technology and, and uh, sophisticated parts uh, uh, industrial manufacturer. Corning makes parts for Apple iPhones. They make parts for life sciences and many industrial applications. And Corning has registered a prefix that corresponds with their corporate, corporate name, Corning. Uh, Corning also has a number of global strategic business units. Um, and so Corning may want to distinguish between those business units by using the concept of a quip sub-prefix. A sub-prefix is a name that's added to a prefix so that companies and, and their clients and their customers can distinguish or dif differentiate between products and brands and geographic areas or other parts of an organization that matter. So as an example, we'll take Corning and its life sciences unit. So the, the format is we have a prefix Corning separated from the sub prefix by the full stop character dot. We all know dot from our internet uh, days dot corning dot life sciences. Um, so this is the, the essential components of equip prefix and equip sub prefix. The most important part is the prefix. 
you can't have a sub-prefix without a prefix. So if you register a prefix for your company, then you can associate any number of sub-prefixes with that prefix. So Corning.LifeSciences is, is a good example. Corning, Corning has a product that's very uh, that's become rather famous called Gorilla Glass. So Corning might register Corning.Gorilla Glass as another sub-prefix. So how does a prefix work? Well, here's an example from Corning. Um, the C prefix and the sub-prefix are used to link the product identifier for products managed or owned and, and, and uh, managed by Corning to the corresponding technical specifications that Peter was talking about. Uh, so as a sample identifier, Corning.LifeSciences with the, the full stop character colon is separated, uh, separates the prefix and the subprefix from the part number, 354841 in this example. So Corning.LifeSciences colon 354841 describes a product that Corning's Life Sciences unit manufactures. And I'm not going to try to explain what this product is, except that it looks to me like a test tube that's used in medical uh, services. Uh, and this corresponds to a uh, product specification that Corning uh, maintains and that customers of Corning's life sciences businesses can now access by using that string of identifiers and, and using it globally without having to know the context of the uh, identifier. In the past, the identifier stood alone as product number 354841. The concept of the prefix and the sub-prefix did not exist until we've implemented this standard. So why should a company register a prefix? Well, in Saudi Arabia, all organizations that supply products and replacement parts to customers in Saudi Arabia must assign the QIP prefix or a NATO cage code to each identifier so that the customers who need to purchase those products can find the corresponding technical specification. And all organizations that supply products and replacement parts must also format their technical specifications to comply with 22745 so that they're searchable, so they're machine readable. To Peter's point, a PDF in the data world is what we call unstructured data. In other words, it's not sortable, it's not searchable. Um, it can be with modifications, but in general, most PDF documents produced by manufacturers to describe their products are unstructured data. And what the standard does is it defines a structured data format so that it's machine readable so that if I go all the way back to the beginning of my career, we can establish a straight through process without manual intervention to purchase and deliver and settle a transaction with a customer um, using a straight through automated process, a streamlined process. So what are the alternatives? Well, to describe your products, you can use one of two objects. You can use a quip prefix which is a branded concept, Corning Inc. has registered the prefix Corning. But Corning could also choose to use a prefix based upon their NATO cage code. Corning's NATO cage code is 1C6B0. So Corning could choose to, to preface its product that we looked at on the previous page with the prefix 1C6B0 colon and then the product identifier. The problem with that is it's kind of hard to read and, and a machine can understand it if the machine has the full catalog of several million cage codes and the corresponding company information for each of those codes, but that list is not very well maintained and it's rather hard to manage. The quick prefix is easily identifiable and it maps to a set of resolution services that point to a location for Corning where their technical specifications are maintained. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but so the concept is that a company can register a prefix that, that includes its brand, or it can use a NATO cage code if it is part of the NATO procurement organization. 
and the Native Codification Bureau, and it can use that cage code instead. So what happens if Corning had taken no action? Uh, well, they probably would have had to, at some point, choose a different prefix because other companies and possibly individuals could legitimately register the prefix Corning. We've given some examples here. There's uh, Corning, uh, uh, Owens Corning and Dow Corning are separate companies now that have spun off from the original Corning Glassworks. The Corning Museum in Corning, New York, or the city of Corning, New York, um, or a, a gentleman named Ron Corning could all register the prefix Corning and use it legitimately in the same way that domain names are assigned by ICON um, and the domain name world has evolved. We, we've tried to leverage uh, that domain concept when we developed the prefix standard. So the alternatives, again, are a prefix or a cage code, and then uh, if you have a prefix, you can register sub-prefixes to further identify parts of your organization. The cage code doesn't really have that kind of precision, so one cage code will have to suffice for an organization. So what are the benefits of the QIP prefix registration? First of all, this year in 2017, you can comply with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's requirements. Secondly, and probably more importantly, I think compliance is, is critical, but it's relatively easy to comply. But more importantly, I think you can protect your brand as this new concept of uh, quality identifier prefixes and quality identifiers is, becomes prolific. And straight through processing becomes uh, an important concept in industrial procurement and, and uh, supply chain management programs. And to be honest, this really helps your customers. If you're a manufacturer and you have hundreds or thousands of parts, you can really simplify the purchasing processes for your customers. We did this in financial services and the industry invest, invested hundreds of millions of dollars over several decades to automate procedures, but it has saved investors billions of dollars in canceled orders and corrections, in, in mandates that are no longer violated, and, and things like that. So, um, so this is the, uh, let's see, I just lost it. There it is. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, the, the concept of simplifying order management for your customers is fundamental to this. Um, somebody's playing with a screen here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, Another key concept is that by using a quality identifier and a quality identifier prefix, uh, customers can reduce the number of canceled and corrected orders that they receive or that they place with their vendors. This will help them reduce expenses and accelerate sales. It'll help improve operational efficiencies because they won't be spending their time changing project plans for delayed delivery of products of weeks or months. They won't be changing specifications to adapt to a part that they implemented by mistake. Um, there will be many benefits to streamlining and improving the quality of order management. And this is a really fundamental structural change to supply chain management that frankly, I think the financial industry pioneered 15, 20 years ago and we're learning to adapt to the industrial and energy and high technology sectors. So the next uh, step we're going to take, and this is, uh, we're gonna uh, jostle around the screens for a bit. We're going to do a quick demonstration of what it takes to register a prefix. Um, we're, we're going to talk about how the prefix connects to the registry of technical specifications, and how um, some of the uh, companies involved in the supply chain management program, such as the Kios Master Data System, help customers implement quality data procedures and streamline their, their order management programs. So bear with me for a second while I change my screen and bring you to a browser to show you the uh, Let's see, uh, to show you, here we go. Let's 
So there it is. Okay. Um, so this is the home page of the first QIP registry service. Uh, ECMA manages a registry of prefixes with the corresponding resolution server IP addresses. And uh, this is the registrar system that companies can use to register their prefix and to assign that prefix an IP address or a domain name server location so that customers looking for that prefix and the specifications that that prefix is associated with can simply Google or quickly look up that prefix and that part number and find their way to a, a repository such as the ECMA ETSR repository. So in this case, um, the uh, Quip Lab, just like as if you were going to a domain name registrar like Network Solutions or GoDaddy or someone like that, the first thing that you're uh, allowed to do when you look at the Quip Lab website is to search for a prefix. So for, for argument's sake, I'm going to go into the browser bar and I'm going to search for the word Corning. Because I heard Corning is an advanced company and, and I want to be a domain troll and I want to sell it to them next year for $10,000. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I may have a legitimate reason to search for Corning. So it looks like this prefix is not available for registration. And that's because Corning uh, came out uh, very early this year uh, in February as we were developing prototypes and they decided that they'd like to prototype this approach with their uh, with their uh, products and services. So I'm going to pick another prefix and I'm going to say, how about um, uh, motors, uh, just a motor company, as if I'm a, I make motors of some kind. Well, motors is available. So if I'm General Motors or uh, a, a company that manufactures motors and I want to claim that kind of name, I can go ahead and register it. I'm going to pick another one. I'm going to see if I can register ECMA. And let's see about that. Nope, ECMA is not available because it's been registered by ECMA. So I'm going to do one more, and this one I hope should work well, just like the Motors one did. I'm going to pick GM. Now, GM could be claimed by General Motors or General Mills or any number of companies that have those initials. It could be claimed by a person named George Miller or someone like that, if they had products and services that they were trying to market to other companies. Uh, this is really just like a domain name concept. The purpose of that example is that um, we want to make sure people understand that there is no technical limitation to the, uh, to the prefix except those that we describe in the registration process. So I'm going to choose to register this prefix and it's going to take me to a page where I can go ahead and begin to fill out information about the prefix that I'm going to register. So here's where you can find the specific rules that we've implemented for prefix registration. So it must be between 100, 1 to 100 alphanumeric characters. So it could be one character. It could be 100. Um, technically, the ISO standard uh, says that a quality identifier could be up to 254 characters. Um, but we've reserved the last 154 characters for uh, that identifier, for the product identifier that's an internal uh, piece of property of companies that manufacture products. Um, Equip may not include spaces, so uh, we can't have blanks.
if you were just if you read if you, I, if you could read the question, I only see part of it on the screen, so if you read the question, I can probably assist you in answering it. Okay, good, good. Go ahead. Well, at the moment, of course, anybody who is selling to any of the armed forces or the major stakeholders, the very large companies are subject to the program, but our understanding is that this is national and that basically the expectation is that all products that are manufactured in Saudi Arabia will be registered and all products that are imported into Saudi Arabia will also be registered. So the expectation is the National uh, Industrial Information Center its job is to track all the products that are made or uh, that are produced in Saudi or traded within Saudi. So the sooner you register, probably the better. Um, if, you know, you can wait until you receive the letter, but it's sometimes better to anticipate it. It was, it was designed it was designed specifically um, to minimize any impact on IT. In fact, from the Saudi perspective, it's, there is no change required to the industrial license system, no change required to the exemption system because we're simply incorporating into the description of the products the actual part number with the prefix in front. So it's it was designed to, to be able to use within existing technology, existing systems. Uh, it's usable in any SAP system today, any Oracle system, any Info system today as well. I will also, would also point out that although Saudi is taking a lead on this because the government um, is really pushing the program of localization and also they need the data, um, just as you showed John, uh, uh, Justin with Corning, we have other very large manufacturers who are looking at this process or implementing this process to streamline their procurement systems. So Corning is one of those. Corning suppliers are all getting letters, I believe, the next couple of weeks, requiring them to also provide to Corning the um, specifications in standard form and to provide part numbers which are have a prefix. So I, I, I would expect that you're going to see large um, uh, companies adopt this quite quickly because it really is, it streamlines their systems um, and you know, it's like the original EDI, it just makes it easier for them to do business if their supply chain provides data in a common format. I mean, it is, it, it's, it's probably something worth noting that, you know, in the financial world, as you mentioned, it's clearly, Justin, that in, you know, all security exchange findings are now electronic, and they're all based on a standardized uh, XML. And, and this is the way everything is moving forward. What's different here, if it's different at all, is that there's nothing that tells you what needs to be inside your specification. It simply says you need to format your specification in a consistent manner. Um, you also don't need to change your part number. Your part number is exactly as it is. Do not change your part number. Just put a prefix in front that says it's yours. That's all. So it's really, this is not a burden to industry to adopt, and that's why, of course, the governments tend to prefer to go this way. Spaces oh, between letters or characters? Equip can include some special characters, but it, it cannot include other special characters. Some special characters are very meaningful, as we know, in the data well, processing world, um, like the yeah, at character. I know you can answer that. But one. we'll let you use it here. As well, the full stop bang like and some things like that. Then you're going to have there are some characters, though, that we don't want people to use. 
you the standard calls another for the dot and the colon to, work for to be you, parts of the standard, you so you don't want those characters the used. The and there are several other characters that have back from them. meaning in uh, certain algorithmic processors and, and other data processing regimes, so we're going to be careful with those. Things that you see typically in, in software code. Um, finally, a quip is not case sensitive, so it could be uppercase GM or lowercase GM, and we don't uh, really mean to enforce that, and the standard does not require that. So we would go down uh, and fill out the form about the sure. prefix, about the kind of entity that this is, yeah. about the, yeah. the complete legal name of the entity. We'd ask for some other identifiers from other yeah, uh, I'm, regimes. We, if I, there's I, a cage code, we'll ask for that cage code because General it's Motors a way of validating Mills address information. One of one of the two we'll ask for it, legal entity identifiers if companies are issuers um, of securities. Anyway. Uh, we'll ask for the domain and the resolution server name server address and the resolution server IP address. And this is important because this is where your customers are going to go to find those technical specifications. For now, we've defaulted uh, well, to the ECMA domain um, for and ECMA subdomain for the ETSR, ECMA's electronic uh, technical specifications repository. And today there are about four and a half million specifications, I believe, in the ETSR. And we've also used the IP address for ECMA um, your, uh, as well. You can, if you register a prefix, you can go in and change that um, request. Uh, and you to must your own that resolution name server or your so own IP where, address. Where do I send um, the and then finally, we ask whether there are restrictions to the use of your name. Um, so some companies don't want to see like their names website, being used in other running. product and basically, uh, promotional, in the meantime, you can uh, always register uh, and or, or put, I guess, solutions. And, and so uh, many companies want to restrict the use of their name in, uh, in software and in other companies' data processing programs. From, uh, in the financial services example, sector, a great example uh, is the uh, Reuters uh, instrument code or Reuters information code. It's got a couple of different names. The RIC, the RIC is a prolific identifier that uh, was free and easy to use for a long time, just like the QSIP and several other industry identifiers and financial services. And now today, each of those organizations wants you to pay a license fee, um, and they have restrictions on the use of their name if you don't pay, agree to pay that license fee. And so we also ask for the, the, the contact information for the person who is the administrator of those use restrictions. So that's what it takes to register a prefix um, companies can register prefixes today. I'm going to see if I can navigate back to the presentation. Let me see. Uh, here we go. And share the document. Let's see. We're almost back. Okay. Um, so uh, what we showed you is the simple registration process. Uh, we will, there will be a number of resources from ECMA and from many, I'm sure, consulting organizations and other uh, uh, internal IT organizations that will be happy to help uh, companies understand how to implement this standard. But from a data point of view, it's a very, very Again, simple process, process and a very, very simple um, concept. Work with our it's a concept that I think has been uh, maturing um, in, again, primarily in the financial services sector, but in other sectors as well for the last several decades. And Peter's been one of the leaders in this space, um, and he's really helped the ISO committees to uh, develop the ISO 8000 standard so that it meets the needs of this massive um, uh, sector of global finance and global economics. So we have some questions and answers, and, and Peter, if, if you can help me with some of these. Uh, there, uh, these were, we received several, uh, quite a few questions actually, before and, and during uh, this call. We've got a number in the text box, and we've tried to summarize the most obvious ones or the most common questions. And then if we have time at the end, we'll take a few extra questions. Um, but first, I want to ask Peter and Ed. Yep. Sure. Sure. Sure, Peter. I'll, why don't I do that? I'll read the question, and I'll let you answer, and then I'll take a stab if, if you want me to elaborate. 
Okay. So the first question is, what kinds of companies doing business with Saudi Arabia are subject to the program? We, we expect that's well, not it's not not uh, the native ones are there already, but we're actually seeing a a very large increase in the specifications coming out of commercial stakeholders, Ramco Sabic and uh, you know Madden and the other groups are coming to the system. So it's really as their supply chain specifications come into the system, um, you're going to see that uh, increase dramatically. And basically, the the technical specification registry is designed to contain verified and, and validated to that point Peter uh, companies can register a prefix today to used it's a rev relatively nominal cost the quality of master data. Um, and so a, I know that uh, from having implemented this kind of master data um, using of managing master tools data like SAP and Ariba and Oracle financials and others this is a relatively simple implementation project for the IT teams managing your procurement and 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 internal systems. Um, we're really adding one or two fields. Welcome. Good. Good luck, and, and again, we hope everybody. If you need any assistance, everybody, we're there to help, and very happy to assist you uh, in these implementations. Thank you. On behalf of the U.S. Saudi Arabian Business Council, uh, Peter Benson, Justin McGrew, we want to thank you 